We would like to welcome you to our new series on the book of Daniel, where God reveals the future history of mankind. Now, Daniel tells us we are in the last moments of human history and concludes with God's redemption of mankind. We invite you to stay with us. We know you will be blessed. I'm reminded of how much I need to know You are for me, you're not against me You are with me, I'm not alone Through all the darkest times and brightest days I know some things will always stay the same I'm Welcome, alone. glad you could be with us again this morning and over these next few minutes, I hope that you enjoy immensely the story that we have for you. Uh, probably one of the most well-known Bible stories of all time, Daniel and the lion's den. And I hope that as we go through this story, there will be some important principles and some lessons for me and for you. I want to go to our picture today. And, um, you know, if you lived on the Pacific Coast... And you had 100 mile an hour winds and 30 mile an hour winds blowing on a fairly steady basis. You might look like one of those trees. I mean, imagine if you wanted to get your hair fixed, you just had to look out at the ocean and you can see how those trees have been shaped by the wind. But I also want you to see that though that is not my house on top of that rock, that is still one of my favorite houses. Uh, man, I just... Wouldn't it be amazing to wake up every day and, and see those 30, 40 foot waves, sometimes 60 coming in and hear you sit up there on that house and you can just feel them hitting the rocks. I don't know. To me, that sounds pretty exciting. I don't know how you would respond to that. Um, I'm living out here in the high desert of Idaho. And uh, so what a different world. Thank you, Sherry, for capturing that moment. By the way, the picture is perfectly focused, but the fog is just starting to lift and just moving away from the coastline. So that's the reason it looks a little hazy. Uh, great story. Thanks, Sherry. Appreciate that. So Faith and Hope for the Day is the name of our series. Daniel chapter 6 is where we are at. We call this one The Lions. And by the way, the artist, um, that is a lion with wings with the king's head on it. Uh, that would speak back to some of the things we think about when we think about King Nebuchadnezzar. But we have also had a change of administration. So we're no longer looking at the Babylonian Empire. We are now jumping in to the story of the Medes and the Persians, a significant empire. This is the silver shoulders that we are going to be looking at here in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar because in our last presentation, Darius and his troops have taken the city of Babylon. And that's where we want to pick up our story here. Daniel chapter 6, starting with verse 1. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom, and over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. So I kind of want you to get a sense that in, in ancient times when an empire is conquered, you know how Daniel ended up in Babylon? Was by taking the conquered populations and integrating them into the culture, you create a sense of stability. Darius is taking a number of the wise men and the leaders of Babylon who are willing to cooperate and integrating them into the empire of the Medes of the Persians to become co-rulers, to become governors, to become administration, to help that transition be smooth. And it says, and over them three commissioner, commissioners of, of whom Daniel was one that these satraps might be accountable to them and the king might not s suffer loss. So God is my judge. Where do we meet him? 
right here in the new administration. And by the way, just not too many days ago, Daniel revealed to Belshazzar, who would meet the judgment of God if you would lose his life, who had corrupted the sacred vessels of God. Now here's this same Daniel, one of the significant leaders in the new administration. So what are the implications of that? I just want to say it this way. Daniel is God's man in a pagan kingdom. Now, think about this for just a moment for you. How, how does God see you within the culture in which you live? How does he see you? Does he see you as his person for the hour? Are you available to God to be used come what may? Now, for Daniel to do that, Daniel can't hang on to prejudice. He can't he has to release those opinions and disappointments in individuals and set them aside and say, God, today I am here for you. And he is free to be used by God now in this new kingdom, this new administration. He's free because he has surrendered his opinions and his prejudice. And he is only about one thing, walking by faith, with God. And that makes him available to be used anywhere, any place, any time. Now, if it is true for Daniel, is that not true for you and for me? By faith in God means that God is our agenda, not in a rude way, but in a way that we are available that we may be his person in the hour for him. So verse 3 reads this way. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. That is the spiritual gift God gave him. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Now, this got out. This was known amongst the 120. This is the talk of the court of the Medes and the Persians right now. Daniel is going to be appointed over the entire kingdom of Babylon? And I'm going to tell you that creates political turmoil and chaos. Because in politics, listen carefully now, politics, I don't care if it's city, county, state, federal, Politics, my friends, is a blood sport. Now, we have evidence of that in this story. Bear me out. Let's see what happens in the story. The king planned to appoint Daniel over the entire kingdom. Let me read it this way. The king planned to appoint God is my judge over the entire kingdom. That changes it in a very dramatic way. Verse 4. The politics. Then the commissioners and satraps begin trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. It's like, okay, if you can find one and you can find one, will you support me so I can take his position? Let's, let's get Daniel out of the way so we can have power and authority. Politics is a blood sport. But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption in as much as Daniel was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Can I just say there's something profoundly significant about living in the moment with God, not being distracted and following after the temptations to enter into areas to make you accused, evidence of corruption. Because if you're walking by faith and they try to find those areas in your life because you're not caught up in the nature of the politics, you are free from them and they could find nothing in him. No negligence or corruption was to be found in him, walking by faith alone. 
set Daniel free. And it will set you and me free. Verse 5. Then these men said, We will not find any ground of accusation against this man, Daniel, unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. In other words, they said, now we have to attack his religion. Now, you've heard me over the book of Revelation and now in the book of Daniel. What I keep trying to tell you is that when politics starts meddling in religion, it results in persecution. I don't care if it's the Middle Ages. I don't care if it's 6th century BC in the story of Daniel. I don't care if it's 10 years in the future. When politics and religion comes together, it results in persecution and in death penalties. Read Revelation 13. You will see it is prophesied in the future. So Daniel is ancient history, but it's more relevant than we actually sometimes understand. I want to read this again. We will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God, with regard to his faith. Let's attack his faith, they said. Verse 6. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. You are immortal. Beware of flatterers is all I want to say about this verse because it can have serious consequences. Now pay attention to the plot. All the commissioners of the kingdom. Is that a true statement? Uh, no, it is not. The prefects and the satraps. All of them. Is that a true statement? No, it is not. The high officials and the governors have consulted together. Is that true? No, it is not. That the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man beside you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, I hope you caught it that we pointed out that none of these statements are actually even true. They are distorted enough to seduce the king into signing a law. And it has a death penalty attached to it. They're good, aren't they? They know exactly what they are doing because they are after the power that has already been stated and promised that was going to be given to Daniel. Verse 8. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. So what I'm trying to tell you, and Daniel is recording this story, is that when the king signs a law, even the king cannot undo the law. It cannot be revoked. It's a done deal. You can't change it. There's no congressional act. There's no Senate. It is not a democracy. It cannot be undone. So what they have established is a permanent death decree for 30 days. That's all it takes. Verse 9, therefore, King Darius signed the document that is the injunction. Now the death decree is in full swing. It is a real thing. Now, when Daniel knew the document was signed, because he's in the court, he goes back to his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had open windows open towards Jerusalem. He didn't close up the curtains. He goes to an open window. I love how the artist has captured this story uh, just in a picture. That window is wide open. He's on the roof. Verse 10. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. Now you think, well, you know, Daniel, you're not very smart. You should have gone someplace where nobody could see you 
and then stepped right into power. You could have made great changes. You could have been a great man for God. We could give him all kinds of lectures here about what he is doing in public. But Daniel is a man who lives by faith alone in God. And his name is God is my judge, and he is going to allow God to be his judge. Don't miss that point. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Of course they did. It was the plan all along. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days, is to be cast into the lion's den? What's the answer to that? Well, it's obvious. The king replied, the statement is true. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king. Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king. Can we pause here for just a moment? It says, and Daniel was aware that the king had signed the document. O king, or to the injunction which you signed, which but keeps making his petition three times a day? Here you sign this law, and Daniel morning, noon, and night is out there in the window in front of the entire city of Babylon. And what's he doing? He is Just putting this right in your face, king. Accusation. The spirit of accusation, the accuser of the brethren, is at work here. Then, as soon as the king heard the statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. He is trying to figure out how do I save this man who has now become my friend, my closest confidant, my counselor, whom I want to put in charge of this entire kingdom of Babylon. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said, O king, recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and the Persians that no injunction or statute which the king has established may be changed. They are not going to let the king off the hook. They have won. Daniel is going to be gone. And now they're going to fight over who gets to be in charge of the kingdom. It's a powerful story. Politics is a blood sport. Don't forget that. You know, I I value anyone who goes into serving in politics. It's a tough job. But it is a blood sport. Verse 15. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persian that no injunction or statute which the king establishes can be changed. And then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Now, I want you to listen to this carefully. We know that Darius is a pagan king. We know that. But he has just made the perfect expression of faith. Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. That is a faith statement. And it can only be based on the belief that God, by faith alone, can save Daniel. No one else can. That's powerful in this story, in this context. Verse 17, a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring. The artist is, you can see there's a stone to put over the door. You can see the lions in that hole there on the screen. And the king had to seal it. That means that hot wax were poured on it and sealed it. 
and he takes his ring and puts his seal stating that the king had authorized this to be sealed. No one can open it for the next 24 hours. I just want you to identify for just a moment with Darius, with his heart. His entire vision, everything he imagined for the kingdom had suddenly been changed and taken away by the conspiracy and conniving of the men around him. Verse 17, and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing could be changed in regard to Daniel, that all of those in authority come with their ring and press it into the hot wax or the clay, whatever they are using, to seal that stone so that no one has the authority to undo it until the judgment is passed. Tough day for the king, isn't it? Not only that, but it's a tough day for Daniel. Because I want you to think about Daniel going down into that. And, and by the way, they kept these lions hungry. So that when you were in there, it was a rather instant judgment. But what is Daniel's name? God is my judge. Daniel says, come what may. God is my judge. If this is his will for me, I will go into that lion's den. And I will trust in my God, even if I am to be their meal. Let's pick up where the king is now in stress. Verse 18. It says, And the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. Then the king arose at dawn and the break of day and went in haste to the lion's den. Now, help me make sense of this. Why? Why would the king be running to the lion's den? I mean, didn't he know that these were hungry lions and they were going to eat Daniel? But again, in verse 19, we are encountering a moment in which the king's faith is still alive and well, and he is going to see Daniel. It says he ran. He went in haste. He can't wait to go and say, Good morning, Daniel. How are you doing? It says in verse 20 that he had come near the den. To Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve been able to deliver you from the lions? And then the voice comes from the lion's den. Daniel spoke to the king. O king, live forever. Did you catch that? My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. Living by faith in this story. Daniel is able to speak and testify to the glory of his God. Then the king was very much pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury, whatever, was found on him. And the Bible says clearly because he trusted by faith alone in his God. You see, Daniel would have accepted any judgment because God was his judge. That's why he didn't get caught up in the political foray. He could be a counselor free of prejudice, not opinionated, didn't have to be right all the time, a humble man. Verse 24, then the king gave orders and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel and they cast him, them. Now, what I'm about to read to you, I want you to understand the importance. In the judgment in this area in 6th century B.C., the judgment had to eradicate the entire bloodline so that it did not create feuds and battles later in time. It says they cast them, their children, their wives, into the lion's den, and they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. 
What a contrast in the story. What a contrast. I don't know how many lions were in there. But those who did not live by faith alone did not survive. It's a contrast put into the story clearly. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the lands. Keep in mind, that's the lands of the Medes and Persians now, who are in charge of the known civilized world they lived in at that time. He writes, May your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever and ever. Can you begin to hear the language of faith being manifested in Darius? He delivers and rescues, performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persians. The end of our story. Now Daniel serves not just a new administration, but he is now able to continue God's man to an entire new empire. God has a way to insert his influence through his people, through you, if you're choosing to live by faith, without the distractions and temptations that would lead you to carry a separate agenda than his. Daniel continues his work by faith in God to speak the things of God to foreign and pagan kings. Living by faith alone in a foreign land becomes a lesson for you and me. I want to go back to another one of Sherry's fabulous pictures for just a moment. That calm tide is slowly coming in. And I just love the reflections in the water. The fog is not yet lifted on this day. It's a, just a serene, quiet scene. I have other pictures. There's a little guy and a little puppy over there, and the ball's being thrown in the water, and the puppy is kind of afraid of the waves, but he's just a little guy out there trying to get his ball. But here you just see that quiet, serene peacefulness of the ocean. Thanks for listening. Go back and look at the story. Let it speak to you today. Blessings now. Thank you for watching today. Our email address is ScreamingRockMinistries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho 83303.